This tutorial on post-operative care in performing an FUE surgery is the fourth section of Chapter 7 of the Practical Guide to Hair Transplantation by Drs. True, Garg, and Garg. In this tutorial, we will uh, discuss recipient area and donor area care, prevention and management of pain and complications such as swelling, infection, graft loss, and also education and management of patient expectations. Proper postoperative care is essential to assuring healing for final results and to preventing complications. The aspects of postoperative care for the recipient area are the same regardless of harvesting technique, whether FUE or strip FUT. However, care of the donor region differs depending on harvesting technique. The focus of this uh, tutorial is on FUE, but I will also be discussing uh, donor care in strip harvesting. The components of postoperative care include wound care, both the recipient and donor regions, pain management, prevention and management of complications such as swelling, infection, and graft loss, and patient education and management of their expectations. For the recipient area, wound care consists of no dressing, frequent spraying of the recipient site, and having the patient have their first cleaning in the office the next morning after the procedure. They then begin their post-operative care the evening of the first post-operative day. Dressings are not necessary in hair transplant surgery. Wound healing uh, will progress very well without them, and it, it, it is safe to not have a dressing. There's no increase in any complications or problems because of not having a dressing. And not having a dressing allows the patient to spray the recipient area very frequently in the first three days. It was recommended that the spray be done every hour. We use liposomal ATP along with saline in our spray. And uh, this greatly helps to inhibit crust formation, which of course uh, speeds the most visible portion of the healing process after a surgery. And ultimately, uh, the spray also helps to promote rapid healing and good results from the surgery. The patient is to spray hourly, uh, but as a practical matter, they spray less frequently uh, during the night. We have our patients use occlusion in, along with the spray. It is essential that we have patients come to our offices the day after surgery for an inspection, reinforcement of instructions, and to provide uh, careful cleaning of both the recipient and donor areas following surgery. Care of the recipient wound really has three phases as far as how the patient washes and takes care of the recipient zone. The first phase is post-operative days one through four and during this time the patient should wash uh, the recipient area one to two times a day. They make a mixture of shampoo and water in a bowl and dip a surgical scrub sponge that we give them in this and gently blot up and down on the grafts and then rinse once or twice with the water from a cup. To dry the area, it's best to have it dry to air or a cool setting on a dryer, but a towel should not be applied onto the grafts as any pressure at this point could dislodge the grafts. Patients also have to be very careful to, that a comb or a brush does not touch onto the grafts during this first phase. The next phase post-operative days five through seven, the patient can now shampoo in a shower, applying the shampoo and then very lightly massaging with either the sponge or their fingertips. 
they can uh, begin the drying process with a towel just by laying it on the area and off, but no rubbing, and then let further drying happen to the air or with a dryer at a cool setting. They still have to be careful to make sure that the comb or brush does not drag across uh, the grass. Then in post-operative period three, days eight through 14, most patients have gone through the initial healing and crusts uh, are, are no longer present. But uh, at, if crusts are still present, we instruct them to apply baby oil, moisturizer, or aquaphor to the grass at night, which will soften the crust. And then with a the shampoo in the morning with gentle rubbing of the crust, the crust will, will fall off. Once the crusts are gone, the most visible portion of the recipient area healing is completed and patients are beginning to be able to get back to an appearance uh, that will allow them to be in, in public, both socially and in, for business purposes, without uh, evidence of surgery. And in this phase, they are resuming normal uh, scalp care and shampooing. With strip harvesting, no dressing again is required. We have the patients come in for that post-operative cleaning uh, the next day after surgery. Patients wash this area with shampoo and water mixture, rubbing lightly with their fingertips or the scrub sponge. Uh, and then they have to maintain a constant thin coat of either liquid petrolatum, aquaphor, or mupirocin on the suture line until the sutures are removed, which in our practice is 10 days post-operatively. For FUE, no dressing is required. We watch the area carefully that visit the day, morning after the surgery. Patient washes the donor area one to two times a day, and they can dry it by using a towel to rub lightly beginning from day one. We ask patients to maintain a coat of liquid petrolatum or aquaphor on the donor area for three to four days. This prevents crust formation. And then we ask patients to use a razor and shaving cream to shave the donor region three days postoperatively. This stimulates re-epithelialization and over, overall healing improves at a faster pace and ultimately this may have a positive impact on the healing of the excision sites. At the end of the procedure, we give the patients uh, uh, non-prescription pain medication, either a non-steroidal or acetaminophen. Uh, when patients have strip surgery, we tell them to take a single dose of hydrocodone or oxycodone with acetaminophen with the evening meal and then as needed afterwards. We also give them a prescription uh, of non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatories for pain relief and instruct them to use that before they would use hydrocodone or oxycodone. Uh, for our patients with FUE, typically they do not need anything stronger than a, a non-steroidal or acetaminophen. It would be very unusual. Uh, when we do give a prescription for narcotic pain medication, it is for three days only, and in our practice, uh, most patients do not even use the full number of pills in that prescription. Swelling of the face and forehead has been a very common problem with hair transplantation throughout its history. It, the onset is typically 24 to 48 hours after surgery and lasts three to five days, and in severe cases, uh, the eyelids will swell shut and there will be bruising. Many things have been tried and they just don't work consistently or very well, such as oral or injected steroids pre and post operatively, compression dressings, elevated position, ice packs. What does work to prevent swelling 99% of the time plus is to inject the recipient area with a bossy solution prior to making recipient sites. I use a modified Abasi solution, which is prepared with 40 milligrams of triamcinolone 
in 150 to 200 cc's of saline plus one cc of epinephrine. We also inject this, solu this solution into the donor area with FUE, and we find that our patients typically do not have any pain, itching, or burning in the donor area after FUE, whereas doctors who do not use this say that this is a fairly common problem for patients in the postoperative period. I think if the dilute steroid probably helps to prevent these problems. There's no evidence for routine use of prophylactic antibiotics in hair transplant surgery. They should be given only with specific indication. Hair transplant surgery is very low risk for infection. Uh, resistant Staphylococcus aureus infections can occur. They are mostly community acquired. We do preoperative antiseptic skin cleansing of our patients. Uh, remember that hair transplant surgery is a clean, not a sterile procedure. We tell the patients they should always wash their hands before they touch their scalp, and they should use only clean hands. And how important it is for them to wash once or twice a day to keep the area clean. We educate them as to signs of infection. The, this shows typical infection recipient area on the left, and a strip harvest uh, air donor area on the right. The initial step of managing an infection is to obtain a culture, and then careful cleaning and debridement of the wound is very important. We assume the infection is being caused by MRSA, pending culture results, and give an empiric prescription of trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole or doxycycline and then further antibiotic treatment is guided by culture results. Graft loss should be an unusual occurrence. It is usually triggered by excessive force or accidents. To prevent graft loss, that first cleaning in the office the day after surgery is very helpful, as are the three phases of progressive shampooing and washing of the scalp technique that I have described. We Restrict activities for our patients to light to moderate for FUE patients for one week and for strip harvest patients for two weeks postoperatively. We warn all patients about bumping their head to be careful, be very careful, putting hats on and off, keep them loose, uh, and to not pick at the grafts. If a graft comes out, uh, any bleeding associated can be controlled with light local finger pressure. The graft can be placed in a saline soaked gauze in a plastic bag in a refrigerator and can be reinserted when the patient returns to the office for wound care. But we have to reassure patients that graft or loss of a few grafts is not going to have any appreciable result on the cosmetic uh, outcome of their surgery and that the sites will heal without any problems, even if the graft is missing. It's really important and helpful to the patients and to us that we educate our patients and manage their expectations. This means giving both verbal and written instructions, and it's very helpful to show the patients video of postoperative care to show them what we're asking them to do. I think it's essential to give our patients immediate access to you as the surgeon. Uh, at the end of the procedure, I always give my patients my cell phone number and tell them they can call me directly with any concerns or problems. I can assure you that patients do not abuse this, and they greatly appreciate having the immediate access without having to go through complicated procedures of an answering service. Routine follow-up calls after the surgery in the first one to two weeks to check on the patient are very helpful to provide reassurance and to identify any problems. The patient should receive an outline for the coming weeks and months following the hair transplant surgery. What will happen? What they can expect? This greatly helps to alleviate anxiety and unnecessary phone calls. And at the end of surgery, we schedule uh, post-operative follow-up visits and 
the routine uh, follow-up visits at four, eight, and 12 months that we schedule for our patients post-transplant. The key points of this tutorial are that post-operative care consists of wound care, prevention and management of pain, prevention and management of complications, and patient education. Potential post-operative complications include swelling, temporary uh, loss of native hair, infection, and graft loss. Post-operative dressings are not necessary. Frequent spraying of grafts speeds healing and prevents crust formation. Swelling of the face is best prevented by injecting the recipient area with a Bosses solution. MRSA should be suspected in all post-operative infections. Debridement is the most important first measure with wound infection. Graft loss is uncommon and is most often precipitated by accidental trauma. Effective patient instructions are best given both in writing and verbal form and repeated often. And most patients do not have pain after FUE surgery. In the textbook of this chapter, we have included sample post-operative patient instructions for both FUE and FUT.